Hello and welcome to another ISAT Learning Lab. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Global Aviation Resource Index, GARI. And to do that, we have three members of the Watson, Farley and Williams law firm in London. We have uh, Abby Carter, who is, uh, specializes in aircraft finance and leasing, and she acts for the source and other airline clients in relation to a range of operating leases aircraft portfolio trading, sales and leasebacks, and aircraft financing from both for both aircraft and engines, including PDP financing. And then we have Natasha Collins, also a senior associate. She regularly acts uh, for and advises international banks and financial institutions, aircraft source, and export credit agencies, and manufacturers. And she's worked on several award-winning deals and in uh, 2022, Natasha was named a rising star by the Air Finance Journal. And then we have Alison Wheeler, who is knowledge counsel for Watson, Farley and Williams. And Alison has advised clients on leasing and financing transactions for over 20 years. And she now provides the Watson, Farley and Williams transportation team with legal support. During um, uh, Alison's career, she was ranked as next generation partner by Legal 500 in 2022. And she was a Law 360 rising star in transportation under the age of 40 in 2016. And she has led and worked on multiple award-winning transactions. Alison also plays a role in the aviation working group. And she has uh, also written numerous articles for industry publications. And with that, I wanna hand over the uh, the scene to uh, the, our studio in London. Thank you very much, Niels. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, so just bear with me one moment. Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen and you can all hear me okay. Thank you very much for hosting us again. Um, I spoke with you previously, I think it was during the middle of last year, um, in respect of aircraft insurances and the problems we were seeing with uh, lessor insurance policies within the context of the Russian conflict. And for many transactions, that essentially became a jurisdictional risk that they needed to deal with, specifically a political risk. Um, albeit, well, albeit one that perhaps none of us were really anticipating or could have anticipated. And it's important in transactions that we do understand to the extent we possibly can uh, any jurisdictional risk that is involved in a particular transaction. And so in today's session, um, along with my colleagues, Natasha and Abby, we're going to cover the following matters. So risk considerations, where does jurisdictional risk come up in a transaction? What is Gary and where do you find Gary? And how will Gary be useful uh, for understanding jurisd jurisdictional risk in transactions. And um, what we'll do is we'll look at some case studies, uh, looking at examples of where you can use Gary and how you can um, understand jurisdictional risk issues coming up within transactions. So firstly, risk considerations, where does jurisdictional risk come up in a transaction? You might see risk arising in various um, elements of a transaction. Sometimes it can pop up at any time, just like uh, in uh, the Russian conflict, for example. But in terms of what we can look at and try to understand now, we can understand risk in the following contexts. First of all, going into a transaction, so at the planning stages. Creditors, and that's uh, whether you're a lessor or a financier, uh, you may want to be able to consider potential jurisdictional risk that uh, could crop up in your transaction. So looking at a worst case scenario, for example, uh, when a party may need to repossess an aircraft or an engine or deregister and ex export that asset, what um, jurisdictional issues may crop up at that time? Secondly, uh, for risk audits. So carrying out a wider risk audit, maybe you want to look at um, a general review of your portfolio to be able to better understand the risk profile of your lease or your loan portfolio. And part of that uh, risk audit may be to highlight exposure to particular jurisdictions that you may have within your portfolio or to show whether you need to diversify your portfolio. 
Thirdly, uh, in the case of a default, you may want to understand what the jurisdictional risks involved are with repossession, deregistering your aircraft and exporting your aircraft. You want to be able to assess where the aircraft is operating and maybe work out where is the easiest place to repossess your aircraft. And then repossession will go hand in hand with a deregistration of your aircraft, and that may not actually be in the same jurisdiction as where you're repossessing. So you might want to be looking at factors such as the speed and the cost of the deregistration and the repossession procedures, as well as any other risks that may be involved. And then finally, uh, disputes. You may want to um, understand what potential disputes may be arising and what risks may um, crop up within those disputes. So that's all well and good, but we're here to show you today how Gary can potentially help with jurisdictional analysis. So what is Gary? Well, Gary was originally called the um, Global Aviation Restructuring Index. It was launched, uh, I think, about three years ago now, um, and it's now been renamed the Global Aviation Resource Index, or Gary 2.0, if you like. And it's an online free interactive tool and it allows users to analyze and compare aviation restructuring procedures, repossession rights and deregistration rights across the globe, giving a scoring system for each of those elements. It currently covers 100 jurisdictions, 168 different re restructuring procedures, and we've had input from 77 um, separate law firms across the globe. Where can you find Gary? You can find it on our website, um, and we've set the link out here on these slides, or you can also just Google WFW Gary, and that will take you to the link, um, and you can then click into to Gary. So feel free um, after this seminar uh, to access it and familiarize yourself with it. Um, and look at how um, you can use it within your transactions. And we'll take you through some examples. So we will take a deeper dive into Gary. So if you can please just bear with me, I'm going to stop sharing the slides and put up the tool itself. Okay, so you now um, see from a Google search, we've Google searched Gary WFW, and I'm going to click on the link. And when you enter Gary, after it initially loads, let's give it a little moment to load, it will take you to its front page and we're going to get started. And that will take us to the initial landing page, which is the map of the world. And we're going to start all of our case studies from this particular page. So I'm now going to hand over to Natasha and Abby to take you through some of our case studies to show you how to um, look at jurisdictional risk and understand aspects of just jurisdictional risk. And hopefully I'll be able to keep up with them in selecting the relevant, pressing the relevant buttons on the tool. So Natasha, Thanks. I think over to you first. Thanks, Alison, yeah. So in our first case study, we're going to look at the factors that impact risk assessment in repossessing aircraft assets from various jurisdictions. So in this scenario, we have the following details. So uh, we're looking at a financing for a Chilean airline. who There's a subsidiary in Brazil to whom it subleases its aircraft long term. The group operate between Chile, Brazil, Peru and Ecuador and financial stability has been up and down over the years. So let's start with South America generally. And if we click on South America on the map, we zoom into the region. And then using the key at the bottom of the page, you can see the jurisdictions color coded as to how highly they score in, re in respect of repossession rights. So Chile scores moderately, but Brazil, Ecuador and Peru are all red and score low. So we can look into the, why this is the case a little later on. So let's take a deeper dive into Chile. So if we click on Chile on the map, or we can also select Chile in the drop down menu on the right. This now gives us 
basic data for Chile, and we can see the repossession score is 63%. The deregistration score is 72%. And there is one local restructuring procedure available to it. So focusing on the repossession data, I'm going to click on the repossession option. And you can see on the right hand side of the screen that you can then add a country to compare. We'll do that a bit later on. For now, let's just focus on Chile. So we'll click on start. So this gives us a bit more information and you can see that the repossession score is broken down into four elements. So pure repossession risk, export risk, third party risk, and the rule of law compliance risk, otherwise known as political risk. And clicking on the information button by the side of each component score tells you what that component actually covers and what part of the analysis feeds into those scores. So you can see there the example of repossession. The summary also shows that Chile is not a Cape Town state and gives Chile a deregistration score of 72%. Finally, we can see the law firm who provided this information. By clicking on the additional summary box, we get even more information. And we can see that the overall score for Chile is moderate, but that its rule of law compliance is a high score. So what does that mean? Well, looking at the fact that there's been successful deregistration and repossession precedent, and that there has not been any refusals to deregister, it seems there is a good likelihood that the courts will comply with the legal rules in respect of repossession and deregistration, which is always reassuring. You can see that there are also boxes relating to alternative registration countries, and this shows whether you can register your aircraft elsewhere, like in Ireland, for example. Here in Chile, this is not possible. So all that summary information is well and good, but what do these scores actually mean? And how do we actually understand the jurisdictional risk in Chile using Gary? So scrolling down gives you much more information. Gary was set up by asking law firms in the relevant jurisdictions a set of questions, the answers of which fed into the scoring system. And the rest of this information illustrates the answers to those questions and why such a score has been provided. So firstly, we have questions directed at the repossession procedure itself. So here you can see an example question 2.1, and this looks at whether repossession remedies are self-help or judicially directed. And you'll see that up in the top left corner, Chile is represented by a burgundy colored box. And for each question, that burgundy color represents Chile's answer. So we can see here that self-help remedies are not available in Chile, but judicially directed remedies are available uh, to both lessors and mortgagees. So why do we want to know whether remedies are self-help or judicially available? And is having a self-help remedy a good or a bad thing? Well, self-help remedies often benefit from being lower cost and speedier, not requiring the creditor to go to court and obtain a court order before being able to repossess the aircraft. However, the lack of a judicial stamp or approval may mean that such self-help remedy is exposing the creditor to higher risk in respect of a wrongful repossession, leading to damages and even offences such as trespass or wrongful interference. And this can also affect subsequent sales of the asset or pricing in such sale. A creditor may instead see a judicial order as being of more benefit as it shows to other parties including aviation authorities for the purposes of deregistration and export, that the creditor indeed has the right to repossess the aircraft. The ideal position would be to have both self-help and judicial options available so that your repossession strategy provides you with as many options as possible. But here in Chile, we just have the judicially directed remedies. And this doesn't surprise us given that Chile is a civil law jurisdiction and self-help remedies tend to be more specific to common law jurisdictions. So if I keep scrolling down, I can see another important question at 2.4. How long will it take to repossess an aircraft in Chile? 
And here the burgundy colored answer indicates that this would normally be between six months to a year. Uh, but remember, we don't have self-help remedies in Chile. And so we're reliant on having to go through a court process. The shorter it is, the better, of course. The cost of an aircraft repossession is a really important factor in our analyzing the jurisdiction in which you may want to repossess. Um, uh, you can see this here. So aircraft repossessions cost more than just a usual redelivery of an aircraft due to the various legal issues that will be involved, such as analyzing rights and contracts and jurisdictional regulations, locating the aircraft, developing personnel, and dealing with access and storage. However, this is of course to be weighed up against the risks in not repossession, re in, in not repossessing, so including asset, um, asset preservation, minimizing financial losses, and exploring new opportunities for the aircraft. Question 2.5 here looks at the cost of a repossession and indicates that the cost of repossession in Chile is likely to be more than $50,000, but less than or equal to $250,000. And this is important to know for our repossession strategy. You'll recall that we mentioned earlier that the initial summary box showed whether or not the jurisdiction was a Cape Town Convention contracting state. And this is very relevant for the purposes of these two questions that we've just looked at, because one aim of the convention is to bring speed, certainty, and cost savings to the process of repossessing aircraft and engines, particularly uh, where the asset is located in a country whose underlying law may otherwise give rise to some issues with repossession. However, as we said, Chile is not a contracting state, and so we don't obtain any be benefit from the Cape Town Convention in this respect. So taking a look now um, at section four, exporting rights. So, Looking at question 4.1 first, and is a lessor or a mortgagee entitled unilaterally to export the aircraft from the jurisdiction without the cooperation of the lessee? So I can see that a lessor and mortgagee can export the aircraft from Chile without the cooperation of the lessee, but will need a court order to do so. And this ties in with our analysis that we spoke about earlier as regards there being no self-help remedies in Chile, and so allows us to plan accordingly in our repossession strategy. Taking a look now at section five, this addresses deregistration matters, and scrolling down to 5.5, I can see that a lessor or mortgagee can deregister the aircraft from the Chilean register without the cooperation of the person named in the aircraft registry. But in the case of a mortgagee, this can only be done with a court order. And you may ask why the position differs between the lessor and the mortgagee such that the lessor can deregister without a court order. And this makes sense if we take a look back up at 5.1, dealing with registration. The aircraft owner, we can see here, is the party in whose name the aircraft is registered in Chile, and so should be able to deregister the aircraft on its own. If we take a look down, back down at 5.6, this is an important uh, question for the rule of law compliance score, in that it tells me that there's some precedent for successful deregistration. So I can get comfortable that it seems likely that the legal rules will be followed by the courts and the Chilean Civil Aviation Authority. Similarly, looking at question 8.1, um, further below under the rule of law compliance. This shows us that the rule of law compliance score is strong at 72%. And it's important for our risk analysis to know our expected outcome. Section six above, uh, also sets out relevant repossession precedent. Uh, so there are some case law examples of where the repossession process has been tested. And you can see here, there are two cases. So that's a quick summary of some of the factors we may want to consider when trying to understand the risk involved in repossessing an aircraft in Chile. However, as we said earlier, our, our aircraft in this scenario operate in Brazil, Ecuador and Peru, and so may not actually be in Chile at the time that you want to think about repossessing. So here we're going to add countries to the analysis. 
So if we click on the, go back to the top, we can click on the top button um, and we can then add at the top left, we can add Brazil, Peru, and Ecuador. So now you can see that we have a set of summary information for each of the countries, all in different colors. And you can look at the, at the four countries and you can look at up to four countries at any one time. So what can we see from this? As mentioned at the start, the scores for Brazil, Ecuador and Peru are much lower than for Chile. And this means that there's a higher repossession risk in those three countries. So at a very quick glance, we can glean that if later on in a deal, we need to think about a repossession strategy, we may prefer repossessing whilst the aircraft are in Chile if we get a choice. Before we move to the main set of information, take note here of the reference to Brazil, to Brazil being a Cape Town Convention contracting state. And we're going to discuss that more in a minute. So scrolling down or using the navigation menu, this takes us through the same set of questions as we saw for Chile. However, now it's been populated with the coloured answers for each of the other countries. So in question 2.1 here, we can see that none of the jurisdictions have any self-help remedies. All are judicially directed remedies. So that point isn't really going to impact our risk analysis anyway. However, Note that there are only three boxes in the mortgagee section for judicially directed remedies. There is no box representing Ecuador. So this indicates that mortgagees in Ecuador do not have judicially available remedies of repossession. And that's an interesting answer and something we'd want to investigate in much more detail with local council as to what may be required, for example, foreclosure. So in addition, what strikes me here is that Brazil is showing that there are no self-help remedies. But as I mentioned a moment ago, it is a Cape Town Convention contracting state. And I thought that the Cape Town Convention essentially provides self-help remedies to a creditor in that jurisdiction, such as repossessing the aircraft. Well, that's only the case where the relevant contracting state has not elected to make the provision of that remedy subject to the requirement to obtain a court order which is of course the case in Brazil. So all this comparative data is helping us build a picture of the repossession backdrop for each of these jurisdictions. If we scroll down a bit to look at question 2.4, so speed of repossession, and this shows that usually it should be a lot quicker to obtain a court order to repossess in Brazil than it would be in the other jurisdictions, with Peru being even longer still. The Brazil answer makes sense, given it's a Cape Town contracting state. And as mentioned, Brazil looks like it is benefiting here from the commercial aims of the Cape Town Convention to bring speedier and consistent resolution to repossessions. However, looking below at question 2.5, it seems it would be cheaper in Peru to obtain such a court order. You can see there. Scrolling down to uh, question 5.5 for deregistration. This shows us that in Peru, cooperation of the lessee is going to be required for deregistration of the aircraft. And that's something I'd want to discuss with local council, because wouldn't the use of deregistration powers of attorney normally assist us with such a process? Taking a look at question 5.7, this shows us that there hasn't been any precedent for refusal to deregister in any of these countries. And if we look further down um, in section nine, there's a section for any further comments. And we see that there is some supplemental information you can see here provided for Brazil and Peru. And this gives us some colour on some of the points we've looked at earlier. So firstly, in respect of judicially directed repossession remedies, we see that there's a note in the Brazil section saying that yes, a mortgagee has been included, but in practice, there has never been any precedent for such a repossession 
as the mortgagee will usually seize the asset and auction it using the sale proceeds to satisfy the debt. And that maybe answers our question as to what is usually done in Ecuador as well, although local council would need to advise us on that. And secondly, we said a moment ago that deregistration in Peru needs the cooperation of the lessee. And we wondered about whether deregistration powers of attorney would assist. Well, here's a note on question 5.5, expanding on that point slightly, saying that it is common for deregistration powers of attorney to be granted, but that they may be difficult to enforce. So you'll see that when planning your transactions, it's helpful to mix and match as to where aircraft are registered and operate so as to understand where there could be risk in the transaction. And so where you may want to try to mitigate the risk, whether via your documentation or otherwise. So I'm now going to pass over to Abby, who's going to take us through our next scenario. Thanks, Natasha. So if we turn to uh, look at um, some restructuring um, uh, scenarios, we saw earlier on that uh, the Gary tool gave us the option to look at repossession data, restructuring data, or both at the same time. So for this example, we'll turn to the recent uh, Brazilian airline Gol and its restructuring to help us with our analysis. So if we can navigate back to the map on the landing page, we can click at this to top button, and then we can click on the Gary logo to take us back to our homepage. So following the challenges that uh, Gol faced in the post COVID era, Goal uh, chose to use a Chapter 11 restructuring to restructure its short-term financial obligations and strengthen its capital structure for long-term sustainability. But before deciding to pursue the Chapter 11 uh, option, Goal, of course, needed to assess and analyze the relevant restructuring procedures that are available to it. So if we take a look at Brazil on our landing page here, we can then click on restructuring and this will show us the restructuring procedures that are uh, available to Goal. Now we can see from the drop down menu that the local law procedures available are judicial and extrajudicial recuperation. However, we can also see that some uh, international restructuring procedures are also available. Firstly, we have the key ones that may apply. Um, and those are listed there. We can see UK schemes and plans and a US chapter 11. And then we have a much longer list of perhaps less likely options for a Brazilian entity, which they could potentially use. So really, if, if anything, a Brazilian entity would be most likely to use uh, a local procedure or chapter 11. So if we can select the first one at the top, um, then we can click start and then we can, uh, once we've clicked through our disclaimer that we've all definitely read in full, um, we can uh, add the other two restructuring procedures um, by clicking on the add um, on that right hand side. And that gives us the option to compare our different procedures. So we now have the summary information uh, for each of these three processes in a different color. And this is split into two scores, a creditor friendliness score and a debtor friendliness score. So we can see that our US chapter 11 is slightly more creditor friendly than the local procedures available, but far more debtor friendly than those local procedures in Brazil. So from a very quick glance on the face of it, it would indicate that if an entity were experiencing financial difficulties, a chapter 11 restructuring for a Brazilian airline is a real possibility. So looking at our scores, each score is broken down into separate component parts with an information button like we saw earlier, giving more detail on what each of those components means. So for example, we can see that speed and cost of a local law procedure is much more favorable for the creditor uh, than for uh, chapter 11 restructuring, which as we know, can be very expensive and take a very long time. Turning to our debtor friendliness score, this has a couple of additional components which are based on accessibility and flexibility for our debtor. When we look at the scores for those two components, 
we learned that chapter 11 is far more accessible to a Brazilian debtor than its own local processes are. And it's also much more flexible. If we want to know perhaps why that is, we can click on that information button next to the accessibility or flexibility score. And that tells us which specific questions feed into that score. So if we wanted to, we could just make a note of those and then we can take a look at those uh, answers. But what would happen if Goal had decided to use a local law procedure? And let's take a look at that in a bit more detail. So we can, again, scroll down or use our navigational uh, menu on the side to jump down to the answers received from local council uh, to get a bit more information. And again, as we saw earlier, the answers are illustrated by way of color coding. Um, so we have our key at the top there. So our section two sets out the basic characteristics of the procedure. In particular, question 2.2 sets out how well developed and consistently applied the law is. We can see firstly that judicial recuperation has been recently enacted or reformed, but as at now is substantially untested. Then secondly, we can look at the extrajudicial recuperation, which is our burgundy color, and we can see that it's not been recently enacted or reformed, but it is underdeveloped or inconsistently applied. And then lastly, we have our chapter 11, uh, which while not recently enacted or reformed, as we well know, is moderately or well-developed and is consistently applied. So when looking at our restructuring processes, it's certainly beneficial to know what we're going to get out of the process. Uh, scrolling down to our question 2.4, this looks at uh, court supervision and to what extent the court or other official bodies supervise the assets and affairs of the debtor or of the restructuring procedure. So we can see that for extrajudicial recuperation, the court supervises procedural matters, such as case management and determining or sanctioning creditor classes only. For judicial recuperation, the court supervises both procedural and substantive matters, but excluding approval of the restructuring proposal on its commercial merits. Whereas for chapter 11, the court would supervise both procedural and substantive matters, and this would also include approval of the restructuring proposal on its commercial merits. Our question three, a little bit further down, gives us some information on how we might actually access the procedure. So whether there are certain financial health requirements or nationality, for example. Our question 3.2 shows us that only locally situated debtors can access the uh, local procedures we mentioned, but that all debtors, including foreign ones, can access US Chapter 11, assuming the other uh, threshold criteria are met. Now we turn to two important points at section four, speed and cost. Our Brazilian extrajudicial process, we can see is much quicker than the other two, as we might expect being it is outside of the court process. Um, and we can also see, um, looking at costs, that chapter 11, as we mentioned earlier, is likely to be the most expensive process. So taking a look um, then at our section five, this covers the rights under the procedure and some of the risks. Uh, jumping down to uh, section 5.8, this covers off the required creditor participation. And so we might ask ourselves here, does the restructuring procedure mandatorily apply to all creditors? We can see certainly for chapter 11 that yes, it does. But for our local procedures, for these two, it does not. So then our question 5.9 shows us that the creditor approval requirements um, as broken down by number or by value. And this helps us see that, for example, extrajudicial recuperation and judicial recuperation both require greater than 50% of creditors by value for an approval, whereas chapter 11 has a higher threshold and requires greater than 66%.
If we take a look then at moratoriums, this is dealt with in our section six. And in all of these procedures, the debtor benefits from a moratorium. Looking at um, our section 6.3, we can see that a key risk factor to look at is, is which creditor actions the moratorium uh, and which uh, it would prohibit and restrict. We can see here then that all three procedures would prohibit or restrict creditors from initiating insolvency proceedings uh, against a debtor and commencing a claim or suit against the debtor during a moratorium. So creditors would be, in this case, prohibited or restricted from terminating a lease or repossessing a leased asset during a moratorium under a judicial recuperation and chapter 11, but not under an extrajudicial recuperation. Moving on then, if we take a look at our, our section nine, we can see from our rule of law compliance section um, where a score is designated for compliance with the CTC principles. So looking at this, we can see that uh, chapter 11 uh, in the Navy score has a score of 88%, whilst the Brazilian procedures score uh, only 36%. Now, we saw previously in uh, the historic Ocean Air case that there were some issues in Brazil as regards compliance with the CTC, um, as at the time it had been uh, implemented by Brazil. And so, as we can see from the lower scores on screen, this looks to have affected Brazil's score. So we'll have to see and keep an eye on, on this score as, as goal proceeds um, as regards uh, how it uh, complies uh, while uh, we go through the chapter 11 restructuring. So having taken all of those factors into account, we can see on balance, uh, looking at all of these in, as a whole, why chapter 11 was, was ultimately the restructuring selected by Gaul. And now if we, we move on to one more uh, scenario, uh, we can look into uh, engine accession, accession risk. And this is, gives us another opportunity to look at some other factors that might come into play when considering jurisdictional risk. And we can look at four different jurisdictions at the same time. So in this case study, we're going to take a quick look at the following jurisdictions. Firstly, the Netherlands. Secondly, Hungary. Then we'll add Cambodia. And then we'll also look at Austria. So we've, we've selected Netherlands and, and Alison will just select the, the other countries as we add them in. Um, and we'll look at these in the context of repossession only. So if we jump right down to section six, um, we can see that in setting out the relevant precedent uh, for repossession, this section also includes whether or not a jurisdiction is a civil or common law jurisdiction. And so this indicates that all four of these jurisdictions are civil law. And this is important because we'll, we'll have a look at how this uh, impacts uh, engine accession risk later. Um, so, as a quick example, then we can scroll back up to question 3.3 relating to engine accession risk. And this asks, under the laws of the jurisdiction, is ownership of an aircraft engine, once attached to an airframe, transferred to or vested in the owner of the airframe? So this is a really important point for a lessor to understand about jurisdictional risk, because if we have an engine that lessor A owns and that engine is installed on an airframe owned by another lessor B, title to that engine is automatically vested in our lessor B. And that means that lessor A could lose its ownership right over that engine. 
So from this analysis on screen here, we can see that all four of these civil law jurisdictions have an engine accession risk in the circumstances um, set out on the page here. So we can see that in the Netherlands, Hungary and Cambodia, ownership of the engine will be vested in the owner of the airframe if that airframe is registered on the jurisdiction's aircraft register. In Hungary and Cambodia then, ownership of an engine will also be vested in the owner of the airframe while that airframe is physically located in the jurisdiction. And then in Austria, ownership of an engine will be vested in the owner of an airframe if the airframe is on lease to a lessee incorporated or whose principal place of business is in that jurisdiction. The issue is that as a result of the engine accession risk, the financial interests of the creditor, whether that's a lessor or a financier, over these engines may be impaired. For example, if a bank such as um, uh, a, a bank in the Netherlands um, were to permit uh, engine swapping in respect of an engine uh, in which that lender has a security interest, it may be a cause for concern in that title to the secured engine may no longer vest in the lender's counterparty in certain jurisdictions, such as those we're looking at here. The parties might try to address this issue and mitigate the uh, damage by building in the necessary protections into documentation from the outset. For example, uh, engine swapping in jurisdictions where there is an accession risk should perhaps be expressly prohibited in the documents where this is acceptable from an operational perspective from the lessee, of course. Or alternatively, you may want to consider provisions permitting swapping, but dealing with the title issues in relation to those swapped engines. Another um, option for the parties to consider is perhaps signing up to recognition of rights agreements between the relevant parties involved. But we'll keep that subject for another day. It is worth mentioning briefly, and of course, as with all information provided in connection with the matters we've talked about today, whether or not there will be a jurisdictional risk in a particular transaction will very much depend upon the specific details of that transaction, and in some cases, interpretation of the law. For example, we know that some commentators take different views on matters such as accession risk, um, of engines in certain jurisdictions. But hopefully by using Gary, we can obtain an indication of a potential risk that then gives us an indication whether or not we might want to investigate this concern um, in a bit more detail. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks Abby and Natasha for running through those case studies. Um, so that's the end of the presentation section of this session. Um, so hopefully that's given you a good idea as to um, some issues that may arise, uh, what actually constitutes jurisdictional risk and how um, you can navigate around Gary to start giving yourself um, some, some questions to ask um, local council as necessary or to start building your, your own repossession or restructuring strategies. So hopefully that has been useful. Um, and please do let us know if you have any comments, any questions you'd like to ask. Yeah, and of course, I forgot to mention that in my opening, that at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A little icon. You can click that and write in uh, any question to the panel. And then I will go over that and, uh, and bring these questions so you can get them answered in real time. In the meantime, while you do that, I have a bunch of questions. I thought this was very, very interesting. And I think this is a great initiative. And I think it's gonna be very, very useful for the financing community. Could you just tell me a little bit about the background, how this uh, system came about, who took the initiative and who has been uh, participating in, in uh, designing the system and feeding all the data into it? Yeah, sure. So um Back, I think about three, three or four years ago now, um, Gary 1.0 um, version one was um, introduced and that was just dealing with restructuring. Um, it was at a time when uh, obviously COVID was, was prevalent. There were a lot of restructurings 
um, going on with airlines. And we felt that this was a good um, database to have available for, for uh, participants in the industry. Um, it was created using um, a lot of our um, friendly lawyer networks. Um, so reaching out to various law firms around the globe and asking them to contribute to, um, to the tool to answer the questions. And then those questions were fed into a scoring system with different weightings relating to different elements of the score. Um, Post-COVID, um, we have, I think, been seeing more and more repossessions of aircraft as well. And one of the feedback that came from users of Gary version one was whether this could be extended to cover repossession, deregistration and export rights as well. So that's essentially now what we have with Gary version 2.0. It's a cumulative um, restructuring and repossession database. Similar um, uh, process as per the restructuring, we reached out to our, our, our um, correspondent firms and they answered questionnaires. And again, that was all fed into um, the, the scoring system. The scoring system itself, I think um, it has a certain amount of, I guess, subjective um, elements to it, um, but also objective elements looking at various world indexes in terms of um, giving uh, rule of law compliance um, scores and things. And I think the, the potentially one of the next steps we will be doing to develop this is to um, have um, more law firms feed into, um, into Gary. So not just for the jurisdictions that aren't yet covered, but also to um, feed into the jurisdictions that are covered so that it gives answers on a consensus basis, which of course um, is always good to increase confidence in the, the database, the more law firms you have inputting into a, into a tool. Uh, so I think that's um, sort of the, the general history of it. In terms of the scoring, as I said, it is a weighted scoring system. So for example, um, when we have produced the overall repossession um, percentage score for a country um, that has that consists of the four different component elements, each of which has a different weighting. So, for example, something like the rule of compliance weight um, component has quite a high weighting of 37.5 percent because um, the view there is that, well, it's all well and good having laws in place um, in a country to deal with the repossession, deregistration and export. But if the courts aren't able to, or the CAAs are not um, applying that law consistently or correctly, um, then that's a, a, a big jurisdictional risk. So the rule of law compliance component has quite a large weighting. We have a question from the audience, uh, and that is, how often is the uh, information in the system updated and reviewed? Well, it's only um, just um, been launched. It was launched back in January. So I think we're anticipating that um, it will be updated probably on an annual basis. But then in addition, if we are seeing or um, being told of developments within a particular jurisdiction that gives rise to a need a known need to update some of this information, um, then I think we'll also be doing updates, uh, ongoing updates as we go along. And I suspect as well that, you know, a lot of our correspondent law firms have invested a lot of time in this as well. And they'll be keeping us up to date with um, things that are happening in their jurisdictions that that may need to um, impact on on some of the answers in the in the tool. And do you expect also to bring in more countries uh, into the uh, the data set? That's certainly the hope, yes. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, you know, if we if we um, uh, come across uh, more friendly law firms who wish to contribute, put their name to this, um, we're you know we're absolutely happy to um, to speak with them and to sort of work out how how best we're going to do that. There's a specific question from one of the participants. Uh, that is asking uh, how one obtains a credit score, or sorry, a, a score for uh, Nigeria, because it apparently is not uh, in there uh, today. 
no. So again, that would be, um, you know, we would hope to add jurisdictions to um, to the tool as, as time goes by. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm just curious, uh, <laughs> doesn't this uh, system cannibalize a lot of your potential business with clients and distract from billable hours? Um, no, I don't think it does. I mean, um, obviously, for for starters, myself and my colleagues, we're English law um, lawyers. We have offices um, around the globe covering um, other other laws. But what this is really intending to do is um, give uh, participants in the industry some underlying knowledge so that they can really go out and work out what are the important points for, that, for them. Um, as um, Abby mentioned at the end of um, her presentation, this isn't going to be, um, this isn't legal advice. It shouldn't be considered as legal advice. It's it's essentially um, information given to participants in, in the market to go out and then explore these points further with their own legal counsel. And that, that's really important to note. Um, that you know, it, it's the starting blocks, it's the building blocks, it's hopefully bridging a gap between commercial knowledge and legal knowledge, but it's never going to be a replacement for actually going out and um, speaking to, to lawyers in the relevant jurisdictions. But is this uh, uh, application offered uh, uh, free of subscription fees and charges? Yes, okay. it is. So previously, Gary, one point, version 1.0, when you clicked onto it on the website, you it was free, but you had to register up and um, get a, um, you had to register in order to get access to the tool, um, even though it was still free to do that. Um, now we've made it even simpler. You don't need to register. It's still free. You type in WFW Gary, click onto the link, and it will take you straight in, um, as I showed you, onto the Get Started screen, um, and then you're you're good to go. Okay. Uh, you mentioned at some point that uh, you could look into jurisdiction, see if they would allow uh, a registration of the aircraft in another jurisdiction. Now, so if I'm a creditor and I am... Uh, uh, financing an aircraft that is operated by an Italian carrier with a home base in Italy, and I have Irish registration. I should I think about the country score? Is it the Irish country score or the Italian country score that would apply? Yeah, that's a good question. And it will really very much depend upon what you're focusing on at the time. Um, a similar um, issue or similar point there is when you're looking at the repossession and deregistration of an aircraft. Um, you're, you might be repossessing the aircraft from one jurisdiction, but actually deregistering it from another jurisdiction. So you need to just take into account that um, you want to be able to, you want to be looking at the deregistration score of a different jurisdiction than that for the repossession country. And that's a feature that's also built into the, into the tool. Um, in fact, I can, if I, stop sharing the slides i can quickly show you on this so just bear with me okay so if i go back to um the start if you were to for example look at the netherlands um Maybe you're looking to repossess in the Netherlands and you're very happy with an 84% um, score, but actually the aircraft might be somewhere else. The, the aircraft might be in France. Um, sorry, you're, you're looking to repossess the aircraft when it's in the Netherlands, but it might actually be registered in France. So you can actually change the deregistration score, um, change the country to France. And that now shows you the deregistration score for France rather than the deregistration score for the Netherlands. Yeah. Okay. Alison, have you been able to detect a, a, some kind of correlation between lease rent or loan margins and the jurisdictional score under the Gary system? Um, not at the moment, no. I think what we are one thing that's going to be really interesting um, as um, Gary is used more often, um, and as we also start um, 
really sort of drilling down into this is identifying trends like that. Um, and one thing that sort of we've got an eye on in, in terms of future updates of Gary is how we can start building in information about trends, um, whether it's in trends of rates or trends in where people are going to repossess um, and how things match with, say, precedent that's coming out of a particular country. So certainly kind of the um, trying to tie this into to, to trends and how things are going is is one thing that we are going to be um, specifically looking at as to how whether that's something we can do within the tool. Yeah. And, and out of curiosity, what is the current score in Russia? So if I, one useful um, thing to know, if I go back to the main screen, get started um, there's this button here called uh, down here the view country list if you click on this you have a full list of all the percentage this is for repossession for repossession for all of the uh, jurisdictions um, it's in alphabetical order and we don't have Russia on on here we don't have that as a jurisdiction covered at this stage was it previously covered um, I don't think it was no Okay. All right. Um, I saw on when, when you were showing the, some of the pages from the application, I saw the uh, Aviation Working Group logo in a couple of places. What is the relationship between your work on this system and the Aviation Working Group? Yeah, so in um, some cases, particularly um, the answers relating to the Cape Town Convention, We've used some of the information, some of the scoring um, system from the Cape Town Compliance Index to um, feed into um, the scores for a particular country. But this isn't an AWG project. Oh. So it's really, it's really branded a Watson Fowler William uh, system, right? It is, yes. Okay. Um, but with um, very much, uh, if we somewhere we've got um we can click on to the contributing firms i am um, my button here is uh covering i think if i were to click on to this um menu drop down here i'd be able to see the contributing firms and as i said there's 77 contributing firms and all of them are listed on here and their logos are shown it's been very much a collaborative project mm. yeah do, do you have that uh, list of the contributing firms? Yeah, let me see if I, sorry, my, the box with people's picture, ah, there we go, let's move that. Okay, here we go. So contributors, we can click on there. And um, listed by country, we've got um, all of the firms that have um, inputted into the tool. Okay. Cool. This I wish this had been around when I was uh, active in lending against aircraft. <laughs> it would have <laughs> saved us a lot of work. Well, we do hope it's um going to be very very useful for for people in the industry um and only getting more useful as um you know as we manage to get more uh jurisdictions interested in in participating and uh, you know i think now it's up and running people will see it and um hopefully we'll get far more interest in from other jurisdictions as well and in particular the, the kind of uh, feedback on how, how these things play out in in real life and the examples of uh, you know, case studies in particular countries is of course highly interesting yes and, i think that's something that we are really keeping tabs on to see how we can um, as I say, you know, make these sorts of trends, um, how you can demonstrate the, the, the threat trends and back up why those trends are happening um, via the, the use of Gary. Yeah. All right. Uh, there were no more questions from the audience. Uh, so I, I will want to thank you so much. That was very interesting. Thank you so much. And then uh, please check into the istat.org website for uh, further labs. There's something planned in May but it may pop up something earlier than that. So please uh, stay in touch with istat.org. And again, 
to the team from Watson Parley Williams. Thank you so much uh, for your participation today, and and okay. see you. Soon. Thank bye you very bye. much for everyone's uh, attention you. today. Thanks. Thank bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.